Though not the first vanishing point racer to hit the 16 bits, Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge was the one to really show that when treated right, the Amiga was a machine which could absolutely do them justice with smooth scaling visuals, but more importantly, some seriously engaging racing action. Which is especially important looking back at what came before, with those conversions of big name hits which well and truly left many a fan feeling quite disappointed at how they turned out. As highly regarded as Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge was, the feedback from players was enough to give both Gremlin and Magnetic Fields a reason to go back and see just how they could up the ante. This is Beyond the Scanlines, a series focusing on interesting games on classic computing and gaming platforms. Debuting in 1991, Lotus Turbo Challenge 2 departs from its predecessor by launching only on the Amiga and Atari ST, with the 8 bits not getting a slice of the action this time around. Alongside those two releases, it would also see a conversion to the Acorn Archimedes as well as the Sega Mega Drive, both of those coming out in 1992. That's not the start of it though, particularly as there are some big mechanical changes to boot. The first of these is in the title, as alongside the venerable Esprit Turbo, you've also got the Lotus Elan. You don't get to pick which one of these you'll be driving though, as instead, you'll alternate between them as you progress through. It's worth noting, there's little difference between how the two handle, as this is about those arcade style thrills of a serious simulation. In fact, the only noticeable difference is in the high top speed of the Esprit Turbo. Considering that you'll only be racing opponent vehicles driving the same car as you, it really is just a visual touch. But a nice visual touch at that. Alongside this is a far bigger change, and that's to the race structure. Where the first game focused on racing your way across a large number of circuits, here you're now against the clock, trying to race your way through the checkpoints and get to the end of each course before your time runs out. The eight courses on offer present a variety of both environments to drive through and obstacles to negotiate. In fact, they come early on with the initial forest course where there'll be giant rocks you need to drive around alongside tracts of water which can be skillfully jumped over, providing you hit the right log at speed. Moving on to the night course and you'll be racing through darkened city streets with lots of twisty corners to negotiate tunnels to race through, and yes, the need to be very quick on the controls thanks to the shorter view distance. From there, it's on to the fog course. Reduced visibility is still quite a hazard here, but you'll also be dealing with traps which will slow you down if you are not incredibly tight with your racing lines. Reduced visibility isn't much of a problem for the snow course, though you will need to contest with slipping around corners thanks to the reduced traction of the icy roads. You get a similar problem with the desert course. This time your traction is reduced from the sandy roads, which makes negotiating the debris and obstacles on the road ahead that touch trickier as a result. Returning to more civilised conditions, and the motorway course makes things tough with the split road, introducing oncoming traffic and yes, the occasional truck crossing your way. Of course, if you could sneak under those trailers, you do get a nice little surprise. Things do get mucky once again with the marsh course, which kind of feels like a combination of the forest course for its water traps and visibility, alongside the other obstacles introduced in the fog course. It's quite the tough one to negotiate at this point in the game. The final course puts you driving inside a storm. Let's face it, this one is quite a punishing one to beat, and if you are not right on the money with your driving, you are certainly not going to make the checkpoints here. That's right, checkpoints. As with any good arcade racer, you really have to make them before you run out of time. Depending on the course you're racing on, there'll be anywhere between 5 or 10 you need to beat to get to the finish line. And this leads to the first thing which is missing here compared to the first game the progress indicator. If you remember this, it was a little bar that showed you the number of laps you had to complete in a given race and how far along you were in that given lap. 
It was a very handy addition because you could see just where you were in the game, especially when it came to managing your fuel supplies. It's also the first divergence point between the Amiga version, which we've mostly been looking at at this point, alongside the Mega Drive release, as you don't have a visual representation of the stage at all on the Amiga. Prior to starting it, you're given a general environmental image showing off the stage. On the Mega Drive version, this screen is reworked to include a course map. This map is also broken up to show the checkpoints, allowing you to get a lay of the land prior to starting the stage. At the end, regardless of whether you've run out of time or completed the course, you'll get your progress shown. And it's a great way to see just how close you were to the next checkpoint if you encountered the dreaded game over. While most checkpoint races require you to complete an entire run in a single playthrough, Lotus Turbo Challenge 2 gives you one great conceit here. At the start screen of each course, you'll be given a level password. Entering this in on the main menu prior to starting a game, and when you start, you'll be whisked away right to that course. You're not going to need to play through the rest of the game to get up to that point. These passcodes offer a few other surprises to hand as well. Cheat codes, which can halt the timer. Ones allow you to continue to the next course, even if you run out of time. There's even some cool surprises in there. The Mega Drive One has a code which offers you a significant speed boost to your driving speed. And on the Amiga, you've got a quick throwback into the past, playing a tribute to Duck Shoot, another of Short Suffered's early 8-bit releases. Other than the password options, from this screen, things do differ a bit between the two releases. On the Mega Drive, you can set your number of players, enter their names, set your choice of automatic or manual gears, and also see how the gamepad is configured. Alongside most of these options, the Amiga version allows you to set your preference for your acceleration control, either by pushing the joystick up or by holding down the fire button. As with the first game, for me, the latter is the better choice by far, in that it feels far more flexible when it comes to handling corners, amongst other reasons as well. The next one is something I'm unable to show, and that's the multiplayer options. Split-screen two-player mode returns, just like in the first game, but this time around, you have the ability to link up computers using a null modem cable. Now, this isn't just between Amiga and Amiga, but you can go Amiga to Atari ST and consequently on the ST version, ST to ST. From two players, each having a full screen view, to four players being split across both machines, it's a great addition to the racing experience by bringing your friends in and really, really being able to go all out, especially when playing for four players. For the most part, when it comes to presentation, both versions are more or less on par with each other. The only real difference is that pre-race screen, which of course shows you the course on the Mega Drive version just puts it ahead of the Amiga version there in my eyes. The other difference is that for the Mega Drive version, prior to seeing the introductory screen for the next course, you're presented with which vehicle you'll be driving. This is done with the reuse of the headlight animations from the intro sequence and is really a nice way to do it. The absence of this, alongside the map from the introductory screen for the Amiga version, is certainly missed there and puts this Mega Drive release just above the Amiga one as a result. The game's intro sequence offers most of the same touches between both, including the spec screens. Though with two vehicles on offer here, they're a little less nerdy compared to what you saw in the first game, though the details are still greatly presented and nice to look at regardless. Jumping to the visuals, and really it's no surprise that based on that first game, things do look great here. The scaling of the vehicles and objects is smooth. It's all well drawn and quite colourful. There's a great sense of speed here, which is probably the most important thing. And with each of the courses offering their own unique palette, objects and style, you've got plenty of detail amongst them as well. Between the Amiga and the Mega Drive, there really isn't much difference in the details. Outside of the squashed vehicles in the Mega Drive, which I put down to the fact that it was originally intended for a US market with a lower vertical resolution. A big upgrade in the game in general is that when in single player, the game now runs in full screen. It's a nice touch and certainly makes the game feel more exciting visually when you're playing solo, which was something I experienced grabbing footage for this video. 
Moving on to sound, and the Amiga version is really known for its great work by Barry Leach here. And honestly, it's kind of a shame the music is only constrained to the front end intro, and of course the introductory screens for each course, which play a nice little snippet of music to sort of get you in the mood for that race. As once you get into the game, it's all just sound effects and speech. It's not really an issue per se, but after being introduced to the game with some great music to listen to, its absence is well and truly missed, especially when you consider that music was available in the first game during races. That being said, the engine and environment audio really does the job here. It's nice and atmospheric, the sounds are great, and it gives you that feeling of being on the road in those kind of places. Especially when in the tunnel sections that you'll see in the night and motorway courses, you get that slight bit of echo driving through them, which really adds to detail as well. On the Mega Drive side of the fence though, it's a little more limited. On the Amiga, the audio took really good advantage of the Amiga's digital audio capabilities, and the Yamaha hardware in the Mega Drive isn't quite as capable, and it shows. The music comes over nicely, though it doesn't have the, the oomph which the Amiga soundtrack offers, and again in game, you're limited to sound effects and scratchy speech for the action. One last detail is really the controls, and both games do feel absolutely solid here. The controls are tight and responsive, though giving you that momentum and weight that these cars offer, and it does, you know, mean you have to be careful when taking corners, slowing down and trying to bank in early to make sure you don't run off and bash into signs and lose precious seconds. When a studio releases a title which became as big a hit as the first Lotus Esprit Turbo Challenge was for Gremlin, the challenges of what needed to be done to make a follow-up as engaging and fresh to play was certainly not one that could be considered easy. But at the end of the day, the team at Magnetic Fields certainly pulled it off. Regardless of whether you go for the Mega Drive or Amiga versions, you're going to have a great time. From the fluid race pacing to the environments on offer, and of course, being able to do it solo or challenge a friend, it all adds up to create a challenging, engaging experience. The number of courses on offer, each taking a good playtime to run through means you have plenty of time to enjoy the game when doing a run, and the addition of passcodes meaning you don't need to replay the entire game just to see your favourite course once again. Lotus Turbo Challenge 2 is absolutely a high point in arcade racing, one which deserves to be enjoyed by more than just fans of 16-bit micros. It's an absolutely essential racer and one more than worth checking out. Which brings me to the end of yet another Beyond the Scantlines. If you appreciated this look back at an interesting gem, why not leave a thumbs up on the video? Got some thoughts? Drop me a comment and let's chat. If you haven't already, do consider subscribing to the channel and yes, ringing the bell to be notified the moment new videos are uploaded. Most importantly, thank you all so very much for watching.